Oh, good morning, everyone. It is March 16th, uh, and this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. And thank you all for being available this morning to talk about S-265, the Child Advocate Bill. Uh, we're pleased that you're here. And we're at, we'll look through and listen to testimony on S-265, and then we'll also spend some time on H-655, which will be coming to us uh, hopefully next week. Uh, so, thank you. And this morning, we've got Mike Fisher here uh, from the Child from the Healthcare Advocates Office. And Mike, why don't you uh, begin your testimony, and then we'll move on to our the healthcare advocate of uh, the child advocate in New Hampshire. Good morning. Good morning. I am Mike. Uh, I am Mike Fisher, the Chief Healthcare Advocate. Um, if you'll allow me, uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to speak for just a minute as Mike Fisher, citizen, former early childhood home visitor for the Madison County Parent Child Center, where I worked for 27 years um, doing early childhood home visiting up till about a little over four years ago. Um, so I, in, in that personal role, I know the child protection system from both sides. Uh, have played multiple different roles on in it uh, as a, uh, a social worker at DCF. I'm sorry, SRS at the time. Yes, just to date. Right. And um, and so from that perspective, I want to give a global. I support the uh, the goals of this bill. It makes sense to have an advocate's office that is um, being a watchdog on our system. Um, and I also want to recognize it's a really tough world to live in. There's, there are tough, tough decisions that have to get made where people are great and upset with those decisions. And decisions have to be made. So I just want to honor and recognize there's nothing easy about this. I know it very personally. I can tell you hundreds of stories, but I won't. Someday. Someday. <laughs> personally. Um, so let me click on my unless there's any questions for citizen Mike Fisher. I will, I will switch to healthcare advocate Mike Fisher. Um, so um, where the advocate's office lives matters. I think is my it's the discussion I want to have with you today. I didn't come with any presentation. I really wanted to sort of give you the example of my office. As, as one example, and there are pros and cons to this decision. Uh, this is sort of on one axis, independence with everything that that provides for, and, um, and on the other side, uh, access and engagement. Um, and so for, you know, for me, I am, I work for Vermont Legal Aid, I am, a, I am employed through a contract. My position is to find full weight state statutes and duties and everything. And there's a contract that goes up for RFP every three years with extensions, you know, annual extensions. So it's an annual contract. We just went through the one this past summer um, where legal aid gets on, it's the contract to do the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, and that provides us a certain level of look, provides us a lot of independence, but I'm not going to pretend for a minute that it's full independence. All of my funding comes through the state budget and through the governor's recommend. Um, and so uh, while the contract and the process that I have with the agency uh, uh, requests of or requires of me to be in touch with them on a regular basis about the cases that we're seeing and about the uh, policy proposals we're engaged in, I never have to ask permission. I didn't call anyone before coming here today and say, hey, heads up, I'm going to testify about this. Um, I, I have, uh, my office has agents on that level. And I think that's important. Um, if you're looking for a, um, a watchdog-like advocate's office that's going to have the ability to say, uh, heads up, we've got problems with our systems. Um, 
So, uh, it, it, you know, another example of that, and it's just a little self-serving to mention, but I'll mention it. Um, my office has been level funded for six years. I have a funding request for an increase in our budget, working its way through the system. I'm hopeful that we're going to get it. I won't have to come back here and ask you for it on the Senate side. Um, but if I was a part of state government, I would not have a funding request for an increase in money. I couldn't. Part of state government can't do that. So that's just an, another example of sort of the corrupt positive side of, of the independence. Um, and um, um, we have, you know, I think the world of healthcare advocacy is different than the world of child advocacy. So I just want to recognize that. We have contracts with, uh, you know, agreements with DIVA and, uh, and the carriers to be able to share information about individual clients uh, with their permission. Uh, and that all works fine. I would, I, would, I would suggest that the world of, you know, when there is a uh, a child protection effort underway on, money, on whatever level it is, there is who gives permission on what level is just much more complicated. Um, so, um, so, I, so I think, and, and, and we also recognize the downside of where I sit. Um, I don't have access to the same information that people in the United state government have. You know, I get to ask for it. There's often push and pull. I feel good about the relationships I have with our partners in state government. Um, but I can report to you over the years, it hasn't been trouble free. So that's the downside of, of the independence model. On the other side, I think you have witnesses. You know, I think I know you have Susanna Davis coming later on today. She, she's she's uh, it's a newer office. Um, which is the example of being inside the state government. Um, uh, but I really wanted to just sort of put those, that dynamic at your feet as you consider where's the right place for this to be. I, I've been in this business for a while. I know the efforts to how to find the best of both worlds, both worlds, put it inside state government with all kinds of assurances of independence. Um, and while those efforts for independence inside the state government may have some impact. Uh, I guess I would suggest that they won't have the kind of, won't create the kind of independence that you get when you have someone outside of state government. Uh, thank you. I have questions for Mike. Go ahead. So the, I think the bill has it in the agency of administration. So what are you suggesting more of a uh, model like the healthcare advocate, and if so, what organization? Where? Yeah, I, I, um, I actually don't want to be suggested if it put in one place or another. I, I want to be saying, if your value in the creation of this office is to have a a, a fiercely an independent watchdog on the system, I think you get. I believe you get less of that inside system. If you're looking for somebody who's inside the system has uh, more access to case files and the data and whatnot, and, and, and working from within to nudge the system, um, and, and I shouldn't minimize. I think you know, I you know, I think if you had you know, you have a taxpayer advocate in here that taxpayer advocates work for tax. Um, and I think that they would tell stories about them pushing the system as well. It's just a different style. I, 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 I don't know if this helps exactly, but I, I, um, when somebody calls our, some legislators often ask me, should I call your officer, should I call the commissioner? Legislators have access to commissioners, should you call commissioners? Um, but you get a little bit of a different response from a commissioner than you get from my office. Commissioner's gonna say, did my staff follow the rules? And if my staff didn't follow the rules, then I want to fix it. Right? That's what I would hope the commissioner would do. Whereas my office is going to say, what does the client want? How do we help the client get that? So it might be 
that the client calls and says, um, hey, Diva measured my income wrong. I should be eligible. And we go and look at it and we go, ah, you know what? Diva did measure your income correctly. But Diva didn't send you an appropriate notice. And so they can't take the action they're taking. Just sort of a, a, a difference in the style. We're, we're out, we are out to be able to more of a progressive advocate. I don't know if that, that is exactly what you asked. I don't mean to suggest that it should be outside or should be inside. I suggest that that decision should be based on the kind of advocacy on the center. Okay. But, yeah, so we, uh, Nolan gave us a, a list of the advocates across the country. Uh, Maine is the one that does it through contract, and all the others are mm -hmm. uh, either administrative or judicial or somewhere or not, embedded in uh, various departments. Okay. But any other questions? That, that, yeah, go ahead. I, I know, Mike, like you said, you didn't want to suggest any place, but what are likely places like legal aid or yeah, anywhere I, else besides the outside? I should be prepared to answer the question about legal aid, and I'm not. Um, I don't know whether legal aid would be interested in, if, if it were an independent model, oh, okay. whether we would be, whether legal aid would be interested. I, I, I would. I would have to say to legal aid personally, a reminder, this is a very complicated book to step into. It's not as simple. Uh, yeah. You know, and I'll just, it's a little bit easier as a social worker. You know, my clients, the family, let's step back to Mike Fisher for a second. My client is the family mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the children, and it's been mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, it's best for everyone for the family to stay together. Uh, there's times when I had to shift my sense of who my client was over to the child and uh, advocate for what I felt was best for the child. But that, that's a social worker can do that in a different way than a lawyer. For sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? We're good. Uh, well, we may, you know, talk again, but this is all very helpful. But we did have some questions that you have begun to respond to. So thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Ask Aaron something before we go to the next witness. Do you have a pen over there? <laughs> I do not have one in my drawer. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other technological difficulties? <laughs> it's old school technology. <laughs> All, right. All right. So, good. So, uh, Moira O'Neill is here. Uh, she is the healthcare advocate in New Hampshire. Moira, thank you. So, a child advocate. I said healthcare. I, this is going to be difficult from here on in. I know that. Um, so, Moira, thank you for being here with us. We greatly appreciate it. And we, we look forward to your testimony. And I know that you have very late in the evening last night. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, we'll follow along and we'll listen to your comments. We, so we have a lot of questions. So we're ready to soak great. it all. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great opportunity to be here. Um, uh, and can you hear me OK? Yes, very well. So, so th thanks, Chair Lyons and, and Vice Chair Westman. Um, for the record, my name's Moira O'Neill. I'm the child advocate for the state of New Hampshire. Um, and we really do appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of House Bill 265, an act relating to the Office of the Child Youth and Family Advocate, which I'll refer to as the office, if you don't mind. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful that that Vermont has undertaken this endeavor um, we in New Hampshire have supported it from its inception because it really is in the interest of Vermont's children. Um, but it would also complete a regional network of support and oversight of children's services. Um, the New England state borders, I don't know if you're aware, are very fluid for many children. We often have lamented the absence of a peer to contact when we had questions about the care of New Hampshire children who are placed in Vermont or when we have encountered Vermont's children in New Hampshire. Um, so today, I really want to reiterate that support. 
And to give you a little context of my expertise about these kinds of offices, I was, in addition to this role, I was an assistant child advocate for the state of Connecticut for 11 years. Um, I complemented that work with doctoral study and completed a dissertation that was a descriptive exploratory study of state children's ombudsman and child advocates across the United States. Um, and now I'm the first child advocate here in New Hampshire and built this office from inception. Um, so this is really an area of state government that I'm pretty well informed and very enthusiastic. And I submitted, as you know, I was up late last night because this is such an important issue. Um, funny that you noticed that. Um, but I, so I submitted comments and, and I just want to go off script a little bit this morning because I don't think I really did service to the why of this legislation. We like to think that we should be confident in the state taking care of and protecting children adequately. Um, and for the most part, I think people get up every morning and do just that. Um, but I think the deepest value of an office of child, youth and family advocate is the broad access to information that quite frankly, no one else has. So child protection, healthcare workers, residential providers, even parents rarely have the whole story. And that's usually what causes disruption in a child's path. So the advocate is in a, a unique position to bring all parties together and inform them of the child's whole narrative and interpret for parents what's happening. So in that way, people can make better decisions on how to serve the child and the family. Um, likewise, uh, with systems, the advocate brings a full big picture view to the table and can build alliances that transform systems. And I found over the years in observing these offices that it's really not a policing endeavor. I know we like to refer to us as watchdogs, um, but, it's, but it's rather more of a partnership that benefits from this independent lens. Um, so we're free of political pressures. We're focused only on the best interest and best practice. Um, and so I really applaud Vermont for recognizing how important that is. So to help you make your decision today, I can speak to the experience of opening an independent office and to the adjustments that we made statutorily in the first years. I can also speak to necessary infrastructure and costs. But yesterday I listened to some of your deliberations on this bill um, and we'll start with a few comments in response to the questions that I heard. And then I'll welcome any additional questions that you have today. So um, first I heard you asked someone, um, how can one person do all the work that's implied within the office's mandate? Um, and it's true that these offices can be overwhelmed with activity. It's a matter of establishing a manageable system to receive complaints and incident reports and to establish priorities that are driven by the trends that emerge from those uh, that data input. So the best approach is to hire knowledgeable, capable, capable staff and invest in a really good case management system um, that has robust reporting capacity. So in fact, those are the two significant expenses of these offices, staff and a case management system. We found in New Hampshire during the first four years that we operated largely in a reactive mode you know, this office was established out of crises and that was the genesis of, of our being. Um, and so there were a lot of lingering concerns that preceded us. Um, and then this year we undertook a strategic planning uh, process with a broad assessment of both our performance and also stakeholder identified needs in the community and therefore demands on us. Um, and I think we've uh, developed a structure and a strategic plan that's informed by those expectations. And now um, we know a little bit more about what the office is, and that's going to help lessen the chaos and focus on really priority issues. Um, it's always going to be a struggle to keep up with that. Another question that I heard yesterday was about infrastructure of the office, and you just spoke with the healthcare advocate about that, and, and he knows the Vermont system a little better than I do, so I would defer to him largely. But I will say about child advocates or ombudsmen, um, that the model has been tried in only two states to date, Colorado and Maine, as you've just mentioned. Colorado reverted into a government setting for, among other things, credibility and sustainability. They are now attached to the judiciary on a memorandum of understanding um, just for administrative support while they maintain independence. Maine continues in the nonprofit model and they are a standalone entity. They had previously been part of a child advocacy nonprofit 
who were unable to sustain them. Um, so they had to establish themselves as a nonprofit, uh, which means that they carry all the overhead um, and the other existing costs that can be sort of devastating to a really small agency. My observation is that um, not having a place around the Capitol, the office um, in Maine lacks the stature and full perceived authority of a government agency. The classical office is designed to have full independence is attached to the legislature's administrative services. Um, many of us are in the executive branch attached to a department of administrative services, which I assume is the equivalent to your agency administration. Um, and that's just for support like human resources, budget management and other operational tasks. Um, I will say there are challenges in independence. There are challenges around the budget that you just heard. There are also challenges around um, the child advocate in terms of um, if, if, it, if it's a, a matter of uh, reappointments um, or salary and those things, um, you still don't have full independence. Um, so those are things to think about, but they are very functional. I would say the majority of the new offices that are is being established across the country are, in, uh, are attached for administrative purposes to the agency administration. And then I heard discussion about the advocates access to children when they're in residential programs, but not in the custody of state, which was an interesting question. So House Bill 265 gives the advocate the authority to speak with children and access information generally when the state is paying for a service. And we often say that where state dollars are involved, we have authority because we oversee the state's investment in children. So if parents or guardians are making decisions about children and placing them in residential programs, then your presumption is that they are providing their own oversight of the child's care. So when a state places a child, not only is the state financially responsible, it also may be acting as the child's parent and therefore must be responsible to oversee the child's care. I think that's the major difference there. Um, there are some situations where we have concerns about a facility that's accommodating children who are placed privately. Um, in fact, recently we received concerns about abusive practices in what was an outdoor adventure camp that during a pandemic uh, evolved into a school. Um, so while we didn't really have direct authority to enter and access children and their records, we were able to seek out other avenues of state responsibility through licensing through public health, through fire and safety and school certification. So in that way, we're able to at least prompt attention to the situation, even though we didn't, it wasn't really in our jurisdiction. Um, and that's sort of one of the benefits is that people recognize the child advocate is at least someone to go to, to get information um, about how to navigate systems. Um, and then you asked how the advocate would impact the new interstate compact being considered. And the new interstate compact on the placement of children establishes a consistent process among states for the movement of children across borders, which I just said um, can be very fluid, especially here in New England. Um, in the context of the advocate's duties, the ICPC represents one more aspect of state involvement in a child's life that would benefit from an independent lens of oversight. So remember that the ICPC is a minimum standard the advocate will have the authority to examine assessments under ICPC, to look at home studies, and to look at all the decisions that are made in placing a child at a distance from their home, um, and offer a layer of assur assurance that decisions are made in the child's interests. In the case of ICPC over residential placements, I can tell you that we routinely contact our peers in other states to inquire about conditions of a facility or information about recent incidents there that may not come up in an ICPC process. Um, where especially if there's concerns after the child is placed and it's been through the ICPC assessment. Uh, when I worked for the Connecticut Office of the Child Advocate, we received an inquiry from the Rhode Island Child Advocate who had recently visited a Rhode Island child placed in a Connecticut facility. And that call prompted us to visit and eventually investigate what were deplorable conditions in that particular facility. And it was actually closed. Over a hundred children moved to a better care thanks to the alert you know, uh, observations of a child advocate from another state. So that give and take um, and alerting is really very helpful. Um, you're in New Hampshire. 
Um, when we see a spate of incidents in a small facility in our state that we know uh, houses children from other states, we will alert the child advocates in the sending states to investigate and be sure that their children are tended to. Um, and I'm sure you're aware that New Hampshire receives children from Vermont at, your, at our youth prison, the Sununu Youth Services Center. Um, my office holds office hours regularly at that facility. Uh, we talk to kids who have concerns or questions on a very regular basis um, to ensure that their needs are met. So on at least three occasions, we've encountered Vermont children who had concerns about where they were going to go when they turned 18 imminently um, and didn't know if there was a plan for them even to get back to Vermont. So we have had to scramble our, our work to figure out, you know, who in Vermont were responsible for these kids and sort of prompt them to respond to them. Um, but without any authority in Vermont, we have no way of knowing if young people are getting the supported transition that they need for the best outcomes. So if there were a child youth and family advocate, we could just call and alert them that this child has aged out of our system um, and they're on their way home and they really need to be transitioned carefully out of that kind of an institution. So those are the major themes of questions that I heard in your discussion yesterday. I'll add that I very much appreciate the establishment of the advisory committee. Um, in my dissertation study, I found that um, the advocate is a lonely position and that the necessity for independence, confidentiality, and neutrality of oversight leaves them with few resources to process decision-making. So New Hampshire has an oversight commission that's supportive but as a public body, there's no space for discussing the child advocates concerns or for taking advice on investigative actions. So I think the advisory committee will be especially useful as a sounding board in the early days of building the office and establishing its processes. Um, it was very well thought out. Um, they'll also be helpful in observing the needs and demands of the office to determine what adjustments will be necessary in future iterations of your enabling statute. Um, it's not uncommon in most states um, that the role is defined by the needs of the system. Um, in New Hampshire, we completely rewrote our statute. Um, we moved it out of, out, of, out of the chapter that it had been to ensure the independence and we expanded its jurisdiction. Um, and so that's something that um, may be considered in Vermont over time. It's always good to get started and then to have a good group of, um, of thinkers um, trying to figure out where's the best place for it, for it to be and, and, and its, um, its uh, authorities and mandates. So I'm gonna stop there and take questions if you have them and, and also urge you to support House Bill 265. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you. So, you. You did spend a great deal of time answering uh, a lot of the questions that we had yesterday and also giving us a window into the work that you do. So we greatly appreciate it. I do have a couple of questions and then I'm sure others will as well. Um, I see hands going up. Um, uh, so I'll just go through the questions as I wrote them down. You were talking about uh, kids in residential facilities and the, your, that you do not uh, work with any child who isn't under the, uh, have a relationship with the state. And so do you have any relationship with mandatory reporters in the various institutions across your state? And what role might they play in informing you about kids who are not under the state? state's jurisdiction? Sure, so um, New Hampshire is universal mandated reporting. So all adults are mandated reporters here. Um, so that's, so, so, that, so there isn't a, a special category of people that you would wanna seek out. Um, and, and so we encourage anyone who calls with concerns to call in a, a report of su a suspected abuse or neglect if they have them. We are also mandated reporters and we will call in reports as well. Although we do maintain confidentiality of the people that we talk to, that's part of our statute is um, people are protected when they contact us. So it is a matter of a third party report. Um, uh, we also do a lot of education um, around the state about mandated reporting responsibilities. Um, and we're part of a, a very big um, project that is supported by the Casey Family Program um, that is um, developing a community resource guide for people who are not sure about 
um, whether something is abuse or neglect or whether it is what's most commonly uh, reported on is poverty, mental illness, substance use that's impacting children's care. So we're very, very active in that role and from our statute that requires us to um, advise upon, assist, and um, take part in um, improving the system. So a lot of education, a lot of outreach, um, and a lot of sitting down and rolling up our sleeves and figuring out how to do the system better. Okay, so if you received a report uh, from a residential facility where there was a, a suspected abuse or neglect and the kids were not under the umbrella of the state, then you would do what? I mean, you, you indicated so, re refer to the Department of Health or Public Safety and have it handled that way, but do you, are there steps that you can take within the child support system? Yes, sure. So we, um, so number one, we would encourage the caller to call it in to the care line um, okay. because they have the, you know, they have first person information about it. We also have immediate electronic access to our Division for Children, Youth and Families uh, uh, case management system and database. So we would check to see if there had been a report filed. Um, if a report is not filed, we would file it ourselves. Okay, thank you. Um, so then I have two other questions uh, and I'll go right to the communication question. It seems like you have a very robust communication system. You have a hotline, you have telephones, you've got education going on. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how it permeates the state and then how many people you have working for you? Because it sounds like a Herculean job. <laughs> sure. Um, so the so the care line, the, the hotline is is the Child Protective Agency, DCYF. That is not our hotline. Um, and we refer people to that. Um, we do have, uh, I, I'll tell you, um, uh, I'll, I'll lay it out for you as it, it turned out. When the office opened, we had a budget of $350,000 and approval for three positions. My position is the child advocate um, and a, a second position that was an attorney's position and, a, um, and another position that was sort of open, what I turned into an administrative position to support the office. The office has to have someone that can run the office. Even though you're administratively attached to a, another organization, um, you still need someone who is you know, ordering paper, monitoring the phones, and, um, and just doing the daily sort of making sure that the office is running. Um, and so, so you have uh, the... The, the advocate and you have a deputy. Um, so here in the Office of the Child Advocate, the attorney that we, um, that we hired eventually was in a similar to a deputy role. Um, and then um, we clearly found that we needed more support and we added staff um, and we also added to the budget. So the budget now, I wanna say is uh, between 750 to $800,000. We have, um, six and a half, or we will have six and a half staff in addition to my position in July, we get one more in July. The biggest expense obviously is staff. Um, what those staff all do, we have the child advocate who um, does uh, almost everything, uh, but also is chiefly um, part, the sort of the liaison to the legislature, responds to stakeholders who are part of initiatives. We belong to any number of committees and commissions who are constantly reporting on things and doing analyses and, and running the office. Um, the associate child advocate, who is also the attorney, um, does much of that, runs special investigations, um, writes reports, uh, manages the staff, and also manages the legal obligations of the office. And I'll tell you one of the things that has taken up most of our resources in, in New Hampshire has been the 91A, we're called the right to know requests. Although we're exempt from those, we do get them frequently. Um, and we have to account for ourselves to, to demonstrate that we are exempt. Um, so, that, so those sorts of things that are totally extraneous to the mission of the office take up some time. We have um, an assistant child advocate who is somewhat of the ombudsman of the office, who takes the calls and works with people who are calling in complaints 
um, attends meetings and um, writes reviews on individual children's uh, uh, care needs. Um, and we've recently added a legal secretary who enters all the data from our um, incident reports. We receive a couple thousand incident reports a year. And, um, and that's, so, that's so that we can keep the data analysis going. So she's very crucial. And our most recent um, hire was um, a legal aide who's doing background research on individual cases. Um, she does summaries of critical incident reviews or critical incident reports. And, um, and she'll also be supporting some of the bigger investigations that the, the child advocate and the deputy or the associate child advocate conduct. And then in July, we have approval for one, one more position, which would be another ombudsman position to handle um, the complaints coming in. So, so there are a couple of things happen. Our mandate requires that we do outreach and education as well. And so the more you talk, the more you educate the public, the more calls you're going to get. So you sort of build that. Um, across the country, the staff range in numbers from one, I think that has recently come to two. And uh, I wanna say that's Kansas and West Virginia. They now have two staff. Maine was one staff for a very long time and is now two. And there's, there's legislation to give her more um, positions right now uh, being considered. Um, Massachusetts has 18 staff and is going to get more. Um, and they have a, they, Massachusetts has a budget of $8 million, uh, which is even hard to have conversations with them sometime. Uh, but there are a couple of these offices that actually provide services. Um, so I think in South Carolina, they actually run the GAL program. Um, so they're not all the same. Um, but I would say that you can be functional at around $350,000 for salary um, and, um, and the case management system. The case management system can be very expensive, uh, but it's really important that you have the ability to collect this data, um, looking at trends in complaints, looking at trends in incidents. I see that you will be um, report, the, the, the advocate will be receiving reports of restraint and seclusion uh, we do a lot of work around there and try to, um, through the data analysis that we've done, we were successful in getting residential programs to be um, uh, required to institute uh, special programs to eliminate the use of restraint and seclusion. Um, and so that data you can see is very, very important in terms of in influencing how the system is gonna transform. Um, and those, that's always the first question that, that child advocates and ombudsmen ask each other, what is your case management system? How much does it cost? And how, um, how does it work for you? I just asked two quick questions and I don't need, don't need a long answer because I think others would like to ask a question. So it sounds like you work with both adjudicated and non-adjudicated kids. Yes. And then uh, your, the work that you're doing with, um, uh, I'll just leave it there for now. We'll, okay. we'll come back as needed. So, uh, Senator Cummings had her hand up. No, it was the, the size of the staff. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. Yeah, this is very helpful just to get into the details. Uh, let me ask this question, and I know that others will have questions. Um, how closely do you work with your Department of Children and Families or similar organizations within state government? And do they provide you the data and information that you need on a regular basis? And does that sort of offset the need for your expanding your staff? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, we work very closely. So our, the first iteration of our mandate um, by statute was to oversee just child protection and juvenile justice in DCYF, Division for Children, Youth and Families. Um, and so we work very closely with them from the beginning. We have an investigative process of critical incidents that uses safety science, um, which engages their staff to review incidents. And so it's very empowering. And then they own the, um, they own the subsequent uh, recommendations and make things happen. So it's rather groundbreaking. Um, then we expanded 
um, it went into effect in 2020, September, we have jurisdiction over all children's services. So any service that's supported or, or provided or arranged by the state. So we're still building relationships with other agencies. Um, and, and there is always a, a little bit of a tension because you're perceived as oversight and oversight is never welcome. And so it's, it's, we've done a lot of work in building relationships so people will trust us that we're there to help. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot the next piece of your question. No, that, that's helpful. Do okay, they provide good. data for you? Uh, oh, yes. So, yeah. so we have direct access to um, the Child Protection and Juvenile Justice Case Management System. We have direct access to the Sununu Youth Services electronic system. We get reports all day about things that are happening in the, in the Sununu Center. Um, we, we, um, we can request data um, from anyone and generally get it. They're, they're fairly um, uh, um, uh, cooperative about that. Um, the more data you have, actually, the more help you need in responding. And I think when I was talking to you about our staff, I neglected to mention that we hired a, a children's services data analyst um, who has been really a remarkable resource to the office. He's a brilliant guy. Um, and is actually probably one of the better analysts in the system. DCYF has had trouble hiring and keeping data analysts because they can make so much money elsewhere. Um, and so we were lucky enough to get someone who's just dedicated to the interests of children. Um, but uh, but that's, that, that generates and supports better and makes more effective and efficient our investigations to have someone who's able to really understand the data. Go ahead, Senator Hardy, and then Senator Hooker. Thank you, Ms. O'Neill, for being with us today. Um, uh, you have a ton of information. Uh, two questions. Um, one is, do you have, speaking of data, do you have data about the sort of outcomes and efficacy of your office? Basically, what's changed for kids in New Hampshire since your office was established? And then my second question is, it sounds like there's a little bit of overlap, but with a different potential um, uh, sort of angle between some of the work that you're doing and some of the work that your office of a division of youth and family services or whatever it's called in New Hampshire, RDCF. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you reconcile the overlap? You just said you have a data analyst, they have a data analyst. So mm -hmm. those are my two questions. Sure. So the so so the data in um, in the child protection agency and the juvenile justice agency, um, generally the focus there is on preparing reports for the federal government, right? I mean that's a big piece of that, um, and also they they have really transformed their use of data um, in the past couple of years to be able to. Um, inform better their, their major transformations that they're, they're undergoing. But they also have a very antiquated system um, that uh, was supposed to be replaced over five years and that got delayed because of contract issues and that were complicated by the pandemic. So they won't have a really good robust system for probably another four years. Um, so we do, uh, my data analyst works with them in terms of accessing data um, and we've found that we are able to generate some reports. For example, um, they report incident reports to us from all the residential facilities by law, but they don't analyze the data. They just pass it on to us. And so we've been able to make some significant changes in individual children's experiences, because by looking at the data, we can see where there are trends, where you know, when, what, when we did our first report on restraints and seclusion, we found that over five years, 20,000 incidents had been reported of restraint and seclusion, but nobody knew what those 20,000 incidents were. So we had the capacity to pick that apart and see like there was one child who was restrained 200 times in a month. And so let's look at how we're taking care of that child. Um, and then that can change for the child and also for the facility. And then we learn from that. And now um, we're able to see initiatives across the board. Um, our outcomes and effects of our, um, our office um, are still very much in the anecdotal range. You know, I can tell you that we came up with a bill and we've supported it and it was passed. And so that, you know, we changed the definition of abuse to, to clarify what emotional maltreatment is. You know, that was a, a huge undertaking of our work. 
but so that's why we did the work of a strategic plan this year that's about to be released uh, because we knew that we needed to find ways to set goals and measure them so that we can demonstrate what is the effect of the office. And hopefully at some point, um, the next child advocate will have um, the ability to do, you know, sort of an analysis of funding on children and looking at where the investments are um, improving children's outcomes, um, including the investments in the office of the child advocate. Okay, great. So do, it sounds like before you came to New Hampshire, though, you had a lot of experience. You wrote your PhD dissertation on <laughs> child advocacy. So is there national data that shows the efficacy of the offices and sort of says yeah. this is how lives of children have been improved? Yeah, there is not. Um, okay. and, and it's so interesting because this is probably the fastest growing segment in state government across the country is establishing these offices. Um, they're generally, I would say, um, established out of emotion to uh, a crisis. Vermont has been more methodical about it and thinking about it. That's rather rare. Um, and it's a good thing because there is some um, and there's there's some criticism of establishing offices in response to a crisis when you know every day there's things happening that could benefit from this sort of role and why wait until a child dies in order to set up this kind of a system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, thank you, Doctor. You certainly have confirmed that this is a lot of work. And I'm just curious to know when your office was established. Uh, thank you for the question. So, so we opened doors in um, on January 30th, 2018. So we're just we've just done completed four years of existence. Okay. And um, I guess how long did it take before you were able to get more funding uh, from the initial treatment? I want to say that we. Um, we received funding for more staff. So New Hampshire has a two-year budget and we received funding. We came in in the middle of a budget. So we had we had funding for two staff in the next biennium budget. Um, and I will say the legislature is very supportive of this office um, and really has come to count on us to bring you know excellent, credible uh, information to inform their legislative efforts. And so they, they've been supportive financially of the office in return. <laughs> Um, because they, I don't know how they measure it, but they do see a benefit when we come into hearings and we give information. It's always very carefully researched, and we are able to use um, the lived experience of kids to inform it, and that's made it a lot easier to make decisions about um, about allocations and changes in policy for kids. Okay. Any other questions? This has been very helpful. We've got now. We got a. a a broader picture of what the office is all about. And, and so we appreciate your taking time to, to help us understand that. Sure, you thank you so much. Uh, I, Senator Hooker does have just, one more question. Just one other sure. question. How long has Maine's office been in existence? Uh, so outside? yeah, Maine's office actually, it, it existed <laughs> decades ago, maybe, I wanna say maybe even 50 years ago, and then it disappeared. It, there was some sort of there's some history there that's an interesting story, um, but then there was another you know tragedy and it came back online. I want to say I'm terrible with numbers, but I want to say that they the ombudsman's been around for probably maybe 25 years or so. But it's a very it's always been a very quiet office. It's only in the past two years that that office has become known um, by the public. Um, because of tragedies um, and people, you know, sort of looking at elevating that office. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I'm I'm going to guess, and I can I can clarify that and send you that information. But I'm it, it's it's something that was on the books many years ago, and then it went away. That and when it was originally on the books, it was in the it was in the state government, um, and when it came back, it was in the nonprofit. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I wish you well. And if you have other questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Oh, we will. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And we won't make you stay up late. I hope. Okay. Um, thank you. We should probably keep moving along. We've got some uh, very good testimony up front. Um, so I'm going to go to Deputy Commissioner Brad Tew, who is here. 
as well as uh, Jennifer Micah. Do you, are you two testifying together or separately? How, how are we doing this? It looks like Jennifer, you're ready to go. We'll be testifying together. But we're gonna, we're gonna, yes, that's good. I like it when you're when you're together. Yes, it helps us. Okay, so welcome both, and uh, we'll just turn it over to you and listen to your testimony. Great. Well, good morning, uh, Chairman Lyons, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erica Radke, and I'm Deputy Commissioner for the Family Services Division of DCF. And as you know, uh, I have here Jennifer Micah. DCF's general counsel, and we'd like to uh, talk today about our perspective regarding the Office of the Child and uh, Family Advocate. And with that, I'll just turn it over to Jennifer to get us started. Thank you, um, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Micah, general counsel for DCF. Um, in listening to the testimony last year, there was quite a lot of testimony, some of some people you've already had in today and earlier uh, yesterday, I believe, um, about what the goals of the bill are. And I think identifying the issues that you want to the, the office to look at is going to be really critical. Um, Michael um, Fisher didn't testify this year, but last year he did talk about the issue of um, mission creep and the need to maintain to know exactly what it is that you want the office to accomplish, especially with two positions. Um, and to, to in order for you to think about that, I, I wanted to help, I wanted to share with you some of what DCF does on an annual basis and over time in terms of um, our, the reporting that we do and the, some of the committees that we have. Um, as you probably know, the legislature commissioned a report by UVM that was a, about a 150 page report um, that came out in October. And uh, I believe there's one more, there might be one more update to that report. And that was a, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollar report. And I, and I hope that you've looked at that and we're, we are using that to uh, improve our systems. In addition to that report, we have the, um, public consulting group report that we commissioned ourselves on the issue of residential treatment. And we are also using that to inform the work that we're trying to do and to improve our residential systems and to move more children into the communities. In addition to those reports for, for our work, um, we, are, we have the juvenile justice stakeholders group, which works with um, people in the, in, the, in the juvenile justice system to improve uh, our communication and work with youth. We have the Children's Justice Act Task Force. We have the Vermont Children's at Vermont Citizens Advisory Board. Um, we are we have recently put in our Families First Prevention Plan. Um, we have the federal review process, which is a, it's a seven year um, cycle, but we but we do updates every year, and we every year we do twice a year we do reviews of 65 um, randomly chosen cases. Um, in addition, we have the National Par Partnership for Child Safety. Vermont was one of the first 13 members of that. There are now about 26 members and we use them for collaboration on improving child safety and outcomes. We have the Chins Reform Work Group, which we're working for with the um, judiciary to improve our, our um, outcomes and systems work with our children. So we are doing an awful lot, um, and that is on top, of course, of all the, the daily work that we do uh, working with families and children. Um, against that backdrop, I wanted to go through the bill with you and discuss some of the issues that we have and some of some recommendations we, we have around that bill. Um, as I mentioned, I think the scope of this bill is very broad, and I think it would be helpful to focus on certain areas if you if you decide to pass this bill um i think that one of the one of the issues i think that we would like to do is would be to have more um case centered work rather than systems work we think that we are doing a lot of systems work right now um and i i noticed that in the testimony of the child advocate from new hampshire that they recently added somebody 
to do that casework. And I, and I would uh, encourage you to put that uh, front and center to help um, families navigate the system. Um, uh, so let me, let me go to the bill itself. Um, uh, 302-3203A states the qualifications of the advocate. Um, the current legislation states- Jennifer, the first uh, can I just ask, will, will you be sending us this testimony in writing? I'd so be happy that, to do that, certainly. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. It keeps us from having to write everything down. We can pay attention to what you're saying and listen. So I can do that, certainly. Okay, good. 3203A states the qualifications of the advocate um, and the current legislation states that the person must be, quote, qualified by reason of education, expertise, and experience, and who may have a professional degree in law, social work, public health, or a related field. Uh, just so you know, that language is slightly different from New Hampshire's legislation on which most of this bill is based. In New Hampshire's legislation, it states that it shall have a, the person shall have a professional degree. Um, and I think that that language without a shall is, is to some extent meaningless because they may or may not have a degree. It doesn't um, serve to inform the person reading it as to what the legislature really wants. Um, and, I, and I would encourage you to have people with particular expertise uh, who understand systems and understand working with families. Um, and this ties into the issue of the deputy advocate. The deputy advocate uh, has no qualifications required under this particular legislation. And we think that's problematic because the deputy advocate, should the advocate leave the position, will be stepping into that role. And as the New Hampshire advocate noted, the um, they sometimes you could have you could have an uh, an administrative person hired who would then be automatically put into the advocate role, which might not be an appropriate thing to do. Um, so the moving on to section 3203B1, it outlines the process for appointing the advocate. The legislation requires the oversight commission to provide names to the governor and the governor is required to pick one of those names. But the legislation does not state how many names are required to be sent to the governor. And you could potentially have simply one name, which I think undermines the um, independence of the governor to make that choice and also um, doesn't require enough of the oversight to commission to really search for highly qualified candidates to send to the governor. Um, substantively, 3205 is problematic for the department. This, this is, I, I understand why this is an essential section. This is about providing reports of critical incidents and seclusions and restraints to the Office of Child Advocate. Um, the problem is we don't have an adequate IT system as we've been, we've been in any number of committees over any number of years discussing this issue um, with you. And at present, we do not have a manner in which we can adequately ensure that these records will get to the child advocate. Currently, our seclusion and restraint, <clears throat> so you, excuse me, our seclusion and restraint reports come to our licensing division. Um, and they come directly from the, or, the organizations that send them. <clears throat> Uh, and we do not have a central database for those records. And we do not have an IT system that can do that. We are literally working on a DOS-based system in many cases. And the, grinky, the blinking green light is still present in our world. And it is presents huge problems with data. I know that both this year and last year, the New Hampshire Child Advocate discussed the issue of the need for data. And in fact, last year, I'm not sure if it was the advocate who testified or the deputy advocate, but they talked about the, one of the things that if they could do anything better, it would be at um, data. We are hamstrung by the lack of data systems. 
um, we can, you know, if, if you if you require that we provide it, we will do our best, but we cannot provide it in a way that will be, uh, be able to um, aggregate the information. Um, the other thing is around seclusion and restraints. We would encourage you to define seclusion and restraint, and I would recommend that you use the language that we have in our residential treatment program licensing regulations. They're fairly, they're fairly broad, um, but it, it, uh, it clarifies some of the concerns that um, we were, some of our adolescent services unit individuals had around, you know, sometimes a restraint can be something like walking somebody down a hallway in a residential program and not permitting them to, you know, move elsewhere. Um, but it is not necessarily laying hands or something like that. So we wanted to make sure that that would be clarified. Um, moving on to section 3208 on confidentiality. Um, uh, so I do think that uh, obviously record, confidential records should remain confidential as they are within the department. Um, but I don't think you want to have an exemption from the Public Records Act for the work of the public of the of the child advocate. I think, like any other entity in state government, you want their files to be open for public inspection to the extent they can be, in the same way that every other entity in state government is required to do. Um, it allowed, it would allow, in, in fact, it allows some of the systems work to be made public and that, you know, if there are, if there are, for, for instance, disagreements between the, the state, the uh, executive branch and the Office of Child Advocate, you know, it allows for sharing of information that might not otherwise be available. Um, 3208 B is a somewhat technical issue we have. It provides that the advocate can provide documents to entities listed in 4921 E1. 4921 is sort of our um, Bible for confidentiality of child abuse and neglect records. And it is very, very specific. And 4921 E1 provides that um, records shall be provided to the court, to parties and attorneys in a juvenile proceeding, health and mental health care providers, educators working with a family, foster families, and mandated reporters. It doesn't include the department, which makes sense because that particular reference is directing the department to provide or not to provide records. But I think that if the child advocate has records regarding a family that we don't have, that we sh they should be allowed to provide that th that information to us. Um, it would be an irony, I think, if you had a child advocate that could not provide information to the department where that information would be helpful for the department in serving that child. Um, 3208C, another um, slightly technical issue, it provides that the advocate can publicly disclose information except about a youth or if there is pending law enforcement investigation or prosecution. I would recommend that this also include a prohibition on releasing names of other family members and kin who are involved with that youth. I don't, I think, I'm guessing that was an oversight, um, but I think you want families to maintain their confidentiality. Um, so, Finally, after going through those details, I wanted to talk generally about some of the cons general concerns we have about this. Um, one, at present, we get an awful lot of records requests. Um, just this year, for instance, we've had 14 public rec records requests just for Family Services Division. We've had um, 23 in the whole department. And we also have 28 what we will call private records requests. And those are record requests from individuals who have been um, in our system in one way or the other, or other. Could be a youth who wants to access their records from when they, could be an adult who wanted to access the records from when they were a youth, could be a parent looking for information. These are a huge burden for us. And we are very concerned that 
this office will in fact create additional work for us that around records and um, providing records to people and going through databases and things like that that are going to be really, really disruptive. So I would ask that you consider that and think about ways that we can um, alleviate some of that, either through additional staff, which I'm not formally asking for here. We haven't certainly haven't gotten permission for that. <laughs> we heard it. <laughs> we heard it. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, you know, but it, it is an issue for us. We really struggle with it on a daily basis. And so um, to the extent that it's not ad not addressed in the bill, I would ask that you consider that. And we will certainly talk some more about ways that we can address that or things that we could put in the bill to, um, to, to have us think about that. Um, it's one, some of the things that were testified that came out last year um, from a doctor working in child abuse and neglect was the real importance of this not being an adversarial role. And uh, I appreciate that you brought in the advocate from New Hampshire. I think it might also be helpful if they were willing to have um, state government officials from New Hampshire or the other states to talk about their involvement with the Office of Child Advocate um, to see what they think, how the office does, and what redundancies there might be um, and how, whether it is in fact non-adversarial. Uh, Michael, Michael Fisher spoke about where to place the office. Um, I have worked in state government for over 20 years and as a, as, as a uh, state employee, um, attorney, assistant attorney general and now general counsel, and I have worked regularly with Vermont Legal Aid um, and I really highly appreciate Vermont Legal Aid. I think that putting us in a position such as an ombudsman makes more sense than having an independent office. It allows them to work with colleagues. It allows them the support of other attorneys in the office to bat ideas around, which I always find really, really helpful, as I'm sure you all do. Um, and to put this as sort of a separate two-person office in a system that is really highly contentious and, and can be very confusing. I think, um, I just think it would be better for the individuals um, who are in the office to have that kind of support. Uh, and, and I also think that Michael um, downplayed a little bit the expertise that comes from the Vermont Legal Aid offices. You know, they know systems, they know the government, they know the people in it. And I think that they would be a really great place to put an ombudsman if you decided to, um, a child advocate or, or ombudsman, however you wanted to frame the, the title. Um, so I think that that, let me just double check my notes if I could. Um, Oh, I also think one of the things that came up last year that uh, wasn't raised by the New Hampshire Child Advocate this year is that if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, they had a fair amount of um, assistance from a private or a nonprofit organization to get their um, IT database in, um, going, and we don't have that. So to the extent that we're looking at putting money um, into a new database system for the child advocate uh, that I, I think you're gonna need more money for that. So I think that concludes my testimony. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to field them or Erica. Oh, I remember one thing actually. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sunny. Hey, you're gonna finish up and then we'll, we'll move on to questions in a minute. Yeah, one of the things I wanted was for Erica to, to, to discuss the complaint process, because I know that um, one of the issues with the child advocate is having them review complaints coming from youth or family. And Erica has some background on how we do that. Sure, I'd love to. Um, we do have what we call the CSTS. That's the Customer Service Tracking System where when we do get a complaint, let's say a, a complaint has been emailed to me, then I will send it to our um, director of operations who will then either investigate it herself or send it to one of her operations managers to, to talk to. Generally, we will reach out to our 
uh, customer to see what's going on. And um, I remember uh, when Michael was testifying, he felt that when um, complaints come in, the first question is, well, what did the staff, what's going on with our staff, what happened there? And that the very first question would be, how can we help? And I'd sort of like to turn that around to, when we do get customer uh, complaints, our first question is, how can we help? What's going on? And then we look to see how our procedures and policies, if they have been, have been met and how that will work to make sure that the situation has been alleviated. So it's a really a nice collaborative effort with the consumer to try to work out the issue. And our complaints are logged in the computer system and tracked just to make sure if there are particular workers that may be having issues or particular issues that are coming up so that we can really address them on a, a large scale uh, process as opposed to them just being one-off situations because it is really important to us to make sure that our system as a whole is functioning. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Jennifer and Erica. Um, it sounds like uh, the IT system and situation is super problematic um, and challenging for all of you. And someone actually stopped me in the hall yesterday to ask me about it. Um, so uh, uh, the word is out, let's just say. Um, it sounds like in New Hampshire, they have direct, the advocate's office has direct access to the IT system so that they don't have to actually make a request. Um, they just have direct access so that to, to um, get to your point, Jennifer, that it would create more requests for you. But if you don't have a good enough IT system, there's nothing to access. It sounds like it's sort of a catch-22. So um, what do you have a request for an IT system and where what's the status of that? We actually do have a request for the CWIS system, which is a, a really great um, uh, child welfare system that it, I believe it is in 45 or 50 states already. So we're sort of behind the, the fence with that. And uh, we have- that's, that's, that. that's unusual. That's unusual. No. It's so, so difficult. IT is terrible. Yeah. So we have a $2 million appropriation from last year. And the issue is that it's a, I believe it's a nine module system. So that, and it's a, we will get federal matching as long as we can have a commitment that we're going to fulfill all nine modules. So we are starting slowly and we are hoping to get going on the first module. But I'd like to also address that issue of uh, whether we had a child um, child advocate in terms of they did make a request, even if they had direct access, what we're using a lot of times are spreadsheets. And this would require uh, our staff to then try to pull together spreadsheets in order to give that information to them. And as you know, our system is really stressed and that would simply uh, serve to take away from what our primary function is, which is serving the youth and children. Okay. And if though this system, case management system, the nine modules were to be fully implemented, that would that replace some of the individual spreadsheets that you're using? With absolutely, yeah, okay. And it, and that it, was my under my guess is that you have various different systems for logging lots of different things, but there's not a comprehensive database that where you keep all of the information. Is that is that right? That's 100% accurate. Various is <laughs> various systems, various little uh, spreadsheets, little here, there, everywhere. And then people have to get together every now and again to try to compare notes so that we can have accurate data. Yeah. Um, Sorry about I that. Wanna... <laughs> and it's, it's not I not have not one fun. question about that. Is it, uh, are we, and will this be integrated with the integrated eligibility system or is this a separate system that we're talking about? I think this is the, uh, this is a separate system. It's, it will be integrated with the eligible, 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 eligible system because part of really what's really driving us 
is to try to get the 4E drawdown. So that we'll have that financial module along with the case management module uh, sort of working together. It, it's going to be a multi-year process, as you can imagine. But you no, know, once we finally have it up and running, it'll be great to have all those different uh, systems integrated. Yes, it will. And I know we've been working on it for a while, so I'm, I hope that we are making some progress. But I think it's so key. It's, it is absolutely key. Yeah. But Senator Cummings has a question. Yeah. I know you wanted to say something more, Deputy Commissioner, but let's let's follow up with the uh, IT stuff. I just wanted to know what's the price tag of all nine modules? <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's this is the last that I heard, so it it may be more at this point. How everything is going oh. up in price, but it was twenty two million, and we would be looking to get eleven million from the feds. So so that's, that's the last number, but it may be more. But is there anything in the infrastructure bill or anywhere in our federal uh, uh, expansion dollars, um, internet expansion dollars that would allow for use of those funds for these purposes? Do you know? I'm not certain. I'm not certain. I would have to check. I know that I'm, always, I'm always after those federal dollars because I think it could be it's a it's a one time spend. It's critical for uh, systemic infrastructure communication. So, anyway. and, and I think the issue isn't just the money. It's also that our IT um, ADS is really backed up. There's just a lot okay. of work to be done, and there's a queue. Okay. Thank you. Senator Hardy, were you, did you have another question? Um, I, well, I'm curious about, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned, you know, not wanting to have the adversarial role with the Child Advocates Office and your suggestion about talking to somebody sort of in your department, your equivalent department in New Hampshire would be helpful. I think that's a good idea. But um, do you, are you concerned? Concerned looking, I, I thank you for your very specific suggestions in the bill. I love that kind of thing. Um, but are you concerned that it would be adversarial? Uh, is your office worried about that? And what can we do in the language to prevent that? So I, I have heard from other states that it can be adversarial. And that's sort of the nature of the office. You know, when you have a system systems often do, you know, try to protect themselves, right? I mean, it's not, I, I don't think I'm saying anything out of turn. Um, and I think that um, when I talk about working with legal aid, what I really mean is you can develop relationships and develop trust over time. And that serves to break down a lot of barriers to sharing information with each other and trusting what each other is going to do with that information. And so um, I think that how this office is set up and how it starts, what the people that you put into it um, and what the advisory council recommends, those will all be really important in um, making sure that the department and others throughout the state work well with the office. Because it won't only be the department that may have conflict with the office. It may well be prosecutors. It may well be um, public defenders. You know, there are all sorts of things that happen. You know, the public defender system is chronically underfunded and people end up criticizing some of the work that they do because they don't have enough time to spend with their clients, but that's not a problem that the Office of Child Advocate can resolve. Um, in the same way that I don't think that the Office of Child Advocate is going to resolve things like um, the Kern Hatton problem. You know, we know what happened at Kern Hatton, and um, it's the problem is that we don't have um, licensing of organizations that would allow us to go in and do something about what happened at Kern Hatton. So I don't think the child advocate can do anything about that. They can, you know, they they are rep 
telling people to go to call the centralized intake when there are complaints, um, which is what happens in Vermont right now. Um, and that's where the current Hatton, some of the current Hatton and, and any other institution complaints came to. And then you do the investigation and you issue your licensing reports. Um, but I don't think the advocate's going to get at that kind of problem. Thank you. I know this is a conversation we're going to have to have, and that's exactly why I keep asking about mandatory reporter connections with the advocate's office. So um, our, that's a that's a huge concern that we all have. It goes to believing children too, right? I mean, it goes to when a child reports something, how, what do you believe? And, and do parents believe, do, do administrators yeah. believe? And, and that's, you know, that's a human problem. Yes, and, but so key to all the work that you are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, everyone who's here. So Deputy Commissioner Radke, did you, have, you wanted to have further comments. So why don't you go ahead and then we're gonna move on to Susanna Davis after that. Thank you. Um, you all mentioned how Jennifer was making more of a nice detailed examination of the bill. And I wanted to just sort of pull back a little bit and look at the bill globally in terms of talking about uh, what the advocate from New Hampshire was talking about in terms of um, you know, mandated reporters or the case management system. Uh, and that uh, sounds like they have what, 6.5 staff and about $750 to $800,000 in the budget. And I'm looking at this bill here, which has what, uh, two people. And then she also mentioned that there would need to be admins. And I just don't see how that bill would manage to do uh, the job that the bill is trying to do. Also, looking at how when Jennifer did start talking, she mentioned the report from UVM and also the, the other reports that we do have in terms of oversight of um, our agency. And what we do with those reports, we don't simply just you know look at them. We actually go through them line by line. We talk to our operations staff, our line staff, and we do come up with specific uh, ideas and things to implement in order to address those situations that are found in the report. So to me, when I look at uh, the advocate, I, I see a lot of overlap that I, things that we're already doing in terms of we have RLSI to do investigations. We have Tracy Casanova who does, who's our uh, ICPC compact administrator and is very knowledgeable in that area. I don't even try to you know look at that myself i just ask her questions because she knows it all so i just feel that in looking at the the office itself versus what we're doing and in, in addition to our trying to be far more robust in answering complaints and being very responsive to our constituents i, I just don't feel that it's necessarily join the meeting you know, answers the question that you need to that you're you're looking to answer Okay, thank you. I think we. I think that's a thank you. Uh, but we will continue to look at the bill and, and try to resolve some of the issues that have come up. Obviously, New Hampshire's population is uh, greater than ours, and so hopefully the we can scale it to Vermont um, as we go forward. But your your point is well taken. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so one you. Question. Go ahead. One last, one question from Senator Hardy. Well, just a quick question, Deputy Commissioner, um, and this might be for, for Katie, our, our attorney, but can you send us that report that you mentioned? We may have seen it, but I'm, we get so many reports, it would be nice to just highlight it and Absolutely. say, this is the one that they think we should look at. That would be great. Sure. Yeah, with that, Thank you. you raised the issue of those two reports, and we probably should take a look at them in the context of this bill. Right. And, and, go ahead. And it might be interesting to know what you did take from those reports and what you're acting on from. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to Susanna Davis and Amy Rose. I know you are here. And Amy, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it uh, obligatory that you testify today or could we have you in the next time we look at the bill? 
I am happy to testify at your convenience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we'll do that. Now I'll give the committee a chance to take a quick break after we um, listen to Susanna Davis. Thank you so much for your flexibility. Thank you. Susanna, welcome. It's good to see you. <laughs> good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you for having me. Uh, why don't you just go right ahead with testimony and uh, looking, I can't remember, did you send something in to Aaron already or? No, I did not submit written testimony and I'll okay. actually be quite brief with the, uh, with my comments. Because I think you heard a lot about the structural, logistical and, and other organizational hurdles um, and benefits related to creating this office in this position. Um, Excuse me, for the record, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. <clears throat> so you, you've heard a lot about the logistical and the organizational issues. And in previous testimony, when this was being covered in the House, I did come in and discuss some of the benefits of creating such an office. So I'll review a little bit of that and then highlight one note um, that comes from an addition to the bill that I'd like to point out for the committee. So I'll just start by saying that um, I am here in support of the creation of an Office of Child Youth and Family Advocate. This is a role that does in some ways resemble my own and in some ways also resembles a close colleague of mine, uh, the Executive Director at the Human Rights Commission. So in our role, we are tasked with evaluating where state government is in its uh, delivery of services, treatment of staff, and its overall uh, systems and the ways in which they do or do not support people from historically oppressed groups. In my case, that focus is on papers supposed to be about racial groups. Although you can't talk about racial equity or inequity without talking about intersectional approaches. For example, we know that um, this is of course Senate health and uh, lifespan is related to health. We know that in the United States, um, members of the LGBTQIA plus population are more likely to be assaulted, injured, or murdered for their identity. We also know that within that population, trans women of color have the highest rate of being assaulted or murdered for their identity. And so when we think about the ways in which race intersects with other uh, identities for historically marginalized or oppressed groups, we find that um, there's a lot of overlap with our work and the work of colleagues around the state. So in thinking about the Office of Child Youth and Family Advocate, um, I think that it would be very beneficial to have such an office or at least a position of that nature in state government because it helps to add eyes to the ways in which our systems are helping or harming individuals. Now, we know that people of color are already at disproportionately higher rates of negative outcomes by state government in a number of measures, whether it's public safety, education and academic outcomes, health outcomes. But we also know that when you break that down, and again, using an intersectional lens and look at the youth population, the population of people who tend to have less political agency, less social capital, less financial capital. And so the intersection of those two identities does make youth of color particularly vulnerable in the youth system in the state. We also know that, as was said earlier, the state borders in New England tend to be rather fluid. And of course, having less personal agency means children often get shuffled around whether or not it's um, what they want or whether they've um, established meaningful and helpful relationships with trusted adults or with peers wherever they've been planted. So having another person who can have eyes on the situation and be able to say not just what's best for youth perhaps when they're not in regular contact with their ad litem or not just what's best for the system and what we see as expediency, but also how are those two things, um, what is the synergistic effect, right? Sometimes government objectives are not necessarily aligned with human objectives or individual objectives. And having somebody who can be quasi independent of state government to be able to look at that is beneficial. Now that's not to say, of course, that I don't trust the, the work that AHS or the DCF are doing. I have really enjoyed my uh, relationship with my colleagues in DCF and I have found uh, that a lot of the decisions that they make are very sound and are well-reasoned and thought through. Despite that, we know that we didn't get to where we are in the United States overnight. Our systems don't look the way that they do through quick six-month rewrites of policy. And so there are a lot of deeply embedded disparities that do need to be rooted out 
And uh, I can just think of a few. For example, we know that families of color are more likely to have uh, complaints made against them, cases brought against them. Um, they're more likely to have cases opened for much longer and to be subjected to a higher level of scrutiny, less respect and uh, flexibility, we'll say, and to have their needs unmet. For example, I received outreach from one parent, a person of color here in Vermont, who informed me um, of all kinds of challenges related to language access, whether or not the right um, social workers or translators would be available during visits, whether or not there was co regular communication. And again, I see the deputy commissioners on the line and, and she was extremely helpful in working with me to, to understand the details of those cases. And there were also points of frustration because it was often the case that I would ask a question about the, about the matter and be told it's not in the notes or the social worker doesn't recall. And so at that point, we have gaps of information that could potentially be either filled in or more deeply investigated by someone in an office like the one being proposed. So um, those are some of the issues. Of course, I'm not going to um, belabor the point, but I did just want to note one curiosity in the bill, which is the establishment of both the Oversight Commission and the Advisory Council. And I, I think that those of you around the table by now know that um, I usually have touch points with a lot of the boards and commissions that are created in the state, because of course, inequity presents itself everywhere. And so while I'm not particularly surprised at the creation of working groups here, I am um, hesitant about there being two separate ones for two reasons. Number one, it adds two government bloats. And just on a personal level, I, I find that that can increase in efficiency and make silos taller. And the second reason is because I want to acknowledge that the advisory council's role appears to be uh, advice from people with lived experience, which is tremendously important in any equity work. Um, and so I, I applaud and I value that. And yet, looking at the oversight board, it also appears that there are people uh, with lived experience who are expected to be part of that board too. And so I wonder what uh, might be reasoning for having two separate working groups and whether one is inherently disempowered by the nature of their duties. For example, if the oversight board has a little bit more authority to perform oversight over the work of the Office of Child, Youth, and Family Advocates, and the advisory committee may have uh, less, less clout or, or less influence or less authority to do the same level of oversight, then we are risking um, undervaluing their contributions and undervaluing their work by having them be separate. So there are a number of ways that we could look at that. One option might be to combine the two. That would lead to a group of a size of 18, which is no small number, and perhaps we could tweak that number. Um, Another option might be to broaden the scope of the advisory council. That's probably a little bit less of a preferred option for me. Um, I do think that perhaps combining the group or at least expanding the oversight commission so that it has that broader representation of people with lived experience, but doesn't necessarily have to run the risk of being duplicative might be a good option. Of course, um, you all have spent a lot of time, you and your colleagues in the house have spent a lot of time deliberating this. So um, I, I'll trust your judgment on that, but that is one piece that I think is important to note. It, this is very much a balancing of um, being uh, having process equity versus maintaining uh, efficiency and streamlining a process. So those are my uh, initial thoughts here. Thank you for listening. And of course, if you have any questions or feedback, I'm, I'm happy to address it. Thank you very much. This is a this is a, a very helpful perspective that you bring. We appreciate it. Is there? Can you put some of this in a short test written testimony that Aaron could post for us? Happy to. Yeah, that would be great. Um, thank you. Questions, committee. Go ahead. Thank you, Susanna. It's nice to see you. Um, uh, I appreciate your comments about the two committees. I noted that too and was wondering why do we need both? Um, but I'm wondering, you know, you probably heard some of our discussion about where to place the office, in, you know, outside state government, someplace in state government. 
your office, which has a similar role, it's different but similar, um, is an agency of administration, I believe. Um, yeah. Where do you have an opinion about where the best place? It, you also miss the Human Rights Commission, which is sort of part of state government, but not, I don't think they're embedded in an agency anywhere. But do you have an opinion about where this should be put? You know, it's. Um... Oh, uh -oh. I just lost you your just, sound. You just are muted for some reason. No. No. What happened? I don't know. I, can we hear you now? now? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. All right. I'm willing to admit when it's my fault, but this time it wasn't. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Um, in any event, the yes, this is a tricky question. I'm usually asked some version of it whenever we're considering creating a new um, a new agency. I know that this uh, the office or the the advocate and the advocate's office are serving in the role of what was described earlier as a watchdog function. And um, it is my opinion that any role that is meant to serve a watchdog function in government, is best when it is independent of government. Um, that is just my general overarching opinion on any such role. Now, specifically with my role, my role is not independent of government. It is embedded in an agency. And, um, you know, I am serving in an administration that I don't worry about in terms of supporting my work. I have counterparts all around the country who do my work who have a different uphill battle to fight because they have to legitimize their work to their own principles. And I don't have to do that. And so um, my, my recommendation that roles like this be independent is not based on my personal experience. Uh, it is just based on the fact that we don't know who the next admin is going, who's going to lead the next admin. And when we set up these roles, it's important that we set them up for success, regardless of who follows, not the players currently on the board, but those who appear in the future. So for that reason, it's my strong recommendation that any role serving a watchdog function over state government should be independent of state government. Now that said, that does come at a trade-off um, with resourcing, right? Are, is this role being actively thought about in recommended budgets? Is this role being supported with um, a, a supporting agency? And I think that right now, the way that things are set up is that when, thing, when offices or commissions are independent or quasi-independent, they tend not to be as well resourced as they need to be. But I don't wanna treat that as if it's a given. We can create an independent or quasi-independent office and also commit to budgeting and staffing it fairly and appropriately. So right now we, ha we exist in, in a, a situation where it tends to be a trade-off, but I contend that it shouldn't have to be. And so creating, um, creating this advocate's position in the office in a way that is independent or quasi-independent, I think is ideal structurally and, and to protect us against powerful bad actors in the future who may not support the work. And I would like to see a commitment from the state to genuinely staffing and resourcing this work so that it's not just a, um, so that it's not just decoration, right? It's not just there for show and is really empowered to to do genuine advocacy and to, to do the work. So I'm, I don't know if I've really answered that for you, but I, I hope you have. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, folks? Okay, this has been really very informative this morning. We appreciate everyone's time and effort and bringing us information. And Amy Rose, we will contact you and have you on the agenda the next time we take the bill up. Does that work for you? That will work wonderfully. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being patient with us. Appreciate it. I know that you have a tremendous interest in this, and we do want to hear your comments. Oh, thank you. All right. So, committee, I think we will uh, we'll take a short break. And then we'll move on to our introduction to 655.